Well, good morning, Web Summit. I'm Jim Motivalli. I'm a blogger at uh, Car Talk and National Public Radio. We're talking about autonomous driving and handling the handover. And we're in that stage, a transition stage, where the car is partly driven by itself and partly driven by a person. And yet, we've seen some evidence that the handover doesn't always go smoothly. If you go back in history, Buick actually did testing of autonomous cars back in 1997, mm. and they stopped that work because they found that people couldn't handle that handover. So we're going to be talking about that, and we have a great panel. They include uh, Karen Francis. She's a board member at NATO that's working on this with uh, visual uh, aids. We have Zach Barras. He's a partner in BMW iVentures. And Adam Kell, who's an uh, investment partner at Comet Labs, which is an artificial intelligence company, and we'll be talking uh, with all three of them. But Karen, why don't we start with you and some of the sure. work that you're doing at uh, NATO. To tell us about what NATO does and um, uh, how you identify driver distractions. I understand that drivers get distracted every four seconds, which sounds like it's amazing that we can drive at all. Well, in some ways it is amazing, but uh, let me explain Nato. Nato is based in Palo Alto, California, and we are a company that has been around a little over two years, and we essentially have a uh, retrofit video safety device tool that uses artificial intelligence to prevent distracted driving and to coach drivers to be better drivers. And the unique element that we're working with is how do we make driving safer today, which is really important, and that's, I think, everyone's ultimate goal is to make it as safe as humanly possible, and then how do we use the information and maps and uh, data that we're gathering through our process today to inform a smarter, autonomous future. And certainly, you know, we all have a human element of when we drive, and we're doing lots of things all the time. And in addition to us knowing when we're distracted, there are often a lot of situations, you, know, you might call them near misses, but things that happen outside of the car that we don't even know happen. And they're not reported because they don't happen. And so it's really important. Our device enables uh, us to see outside of the vehicle, inside of the vehicle, and match those two universes to be smarter overall. Thank you. Uh, Zach Barras, he's a partner with BMW iVentures, and uh, they've been doing some really interesting investments in the space recently, autonomous cars. Talk about uh, what you've been investing in and what you're looking for in, in investments. I'm sure there's a lot of people here who would love to have an investment from you, so talk about that. Uh, thanks, Jim. BMW iVentures is investing in uh, great technology companies that are reimagining transportation mobility, manufacturing. Uh, when it comes to autonomous cars, we're looking at everything from the full stack company that's building autonomous shuttles all the way down to the uh, sensor company that's going to help cars identify their surroundings better. Uh, it doesn't to, actually to have software. to be cars. It can be something. True, if, uh, big data companies that, that help enterprises manage data pipelines, you know, have an application for autonomous cars, but also uh, outside of the AV ecosystem, so we're interested in, in all of those investments. Adam Kell, let's move to you. Uh, Comet Labs is an artificial intelligence company. Tell us how artificial intelligence gets into autonomy and uh, how your autonomous car is powered by that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So um, I would say kind of a little bit similar to what Zach was just talking about. We, we take a kind of a more um, basically, we look at sort of the tools that are becoming developed for autonomy. Those are things like new sensors, uh, new computing chips, new robotic subsystems, and things like that. And what we really try to spend a lot of time thinking about is how those core tools are going to be deployed into traditional industries. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> um, and, uh, you know, not only within transportation, but we also look at things like agriculture, manufacturing, logistics, healthcare. Um, and so we, we sort of have a, a, less, a less focused uh, view on transportation and a little bit more on how these core tool sets can be shared across different industries. Um, so a sensor, for example, somebody building a, you know, one of our portfolio companies is called Point One Navigation. They do a precision location as a service, basically. Um, they can make it so that instead of when you pull out your iPhone and, and open maps, instead of being like a 10 meter bubble around you of uncertainty, it shrinks it down to just uh, 10 centimeters. 
Um, th those types of enabling uh, technologies will be platforms that can be applied to lots of different industries, and those are the c types of companies that we like to invest in. Yep. Let, let's get into this question of handling the handover, because Google showed a car with no steering wheel, no pedals, and obviously they want to go to uh, right to level four. They want to skip the human interaction, but a company like BMW, maybe uh, Daimler also, they like the idea that you can drive sometimes, that maybe you'd have to go to a private track and you could drive there. Uh, then you're going to need a steering wheel, you're going to need pedals. And we have this issue of humans not being able to handle the handover very well. So what do we do? Do we have a buzzer? Do we have a warning light on the dash? Um, why don't we start with you, Karen? Uh, how do we handle the handover? What's the best way to do that? Well, I think that something that's important is that what we have going on right now is an incredible attraction of technology talent coming together to figure out maybe one of the thorniest uh, challenges that they've had in their lifetimes, right? How do you make a vehicle move down the road by itself in a way that's safe and efficient? At the same time, we have humans who have to adapt this concept, not only in their day-to-day -day driving, but also in their heads, right? How many pe people are in conversations and dinner parties where you start talking about autonomous and half the room freezes up because they can't fathom how this is going to work? So really what's important is that companies, as we're de de designing the technology to make the vehicle work, we're also understanding what's going on inside the head of the driver, the rider, the person who today is driving their own car and five years from now might just be a rider. And so it's important to marry the psychology of how people are thinking about this with the technology. At the same time, I think it, you'll see if you were to poll all the different automakers, everyone has somewhat of a different take on how they want to approach this. Some folks want to go straight to level five and the reason being that the human can't really be trusted to respond as quickly as the human needs to respond in a situation. And so it's better to just go all the way to the end and uh, not let the human interact in the, in the middle. Other folks will say, no, we want to be able to transition humans along the way, drivers, so that they feel more comfortable over time and they'll get used to the concept of when to interact and when not to. I, uh, Zach can maybe answer this better than I can, but I don't think there's a definitive path or answer, and I think people are taking different approaches and trying different experiments along the way to figure out which is actually better for people's peace of mind, but then also better from a safety standpoint, because the last thing you want is, is to have someone need to take over and not be able to um, at the last moment. Let me ask uh, Adam and Zach, either one of you could respond to this, but I was recently uh, driving a test Volvo and it told me that I should stop and pull over and a little image of a coffee cup appeared. And somehow it decided that I'd been driving too long. But hmm. I don't know if that involves artificial intelligence, it probably does. But can we use something like that to tell whether drivers are ready to handle this handover? Yeah, I think you're, you're bringing up the idea of giving signals to the driver, that's incredibly important. And it's uh, like uh, eye movements are important, right? Like if I'm blinking a lot, it means I'm tired, right? Sure, so you can have inward facing cameras that can detect drowsiness, that can detect whether people are paying attention. But you know, just stepping back, uh, people are horrible at paying attention in vehicles. Uh, one of our portfolio companies, Zendrive, did a study of about 600 million driving miles uh, and identified that 88 out of 100 drives, uh, people will take out their phones and use it for an average of three and a half minutes per hour. Uh, you mean you despite see all the warnings about this being dangerous? And you see it in the statistics about driver fatalities. So there, there has to be a way to identify when people aren't paying attention and then, and then warn them. Uh, and as you get towards level three autonomy, you know, when you look at what people actually do in an autonomous car, uh, it might be putting on makeup, it might be uh, watching TV, it might be napping. Uh, BMW thinks it's important, and, and I think it's important to use, use tools like geofencing, use tools like live maps to give the driver as much of an advanced warning that, hey, you're going to have to take over because you're going into a construction zone or there's a difficult intersection ahead. You know, all of those things are going to combine. And then to your point about you know, a, a little symbol appearing, using visual cues, haptic cues, audio cues, 
all of those to give the driver uh, as advanced a warning as possible. Well, I recently thought of the scenario where you drive up to a construction zone and there's a traffic light. The traffic light might be red, but there's a, a policeman there and he's beckoning you through the light. How can the car recognize that? Maybe, uh, Adam, you could uh, address that. Sure. I, I think any of, the, any of these types of edge cases are, are exactly the reason why level five is hard. I think yeah. you know, tes Tesla proved several years ago that, that you can, well, for, for the most part, pr produce a, a self-driving car on, on the freeway, because that's, that's one type of level five. And then you know, the, the San Francisco pothole-laden construction zone with people doing different things and one-way traffic going in certain directions. Um, you know, exception handling is the name of the game for like u uh, ubiquitous uh, level five. Um, personally, I'm, I mean, I'm a big fan of the of the people who are trying to operate within the constraints of the uh, of the environment. So, so Nato, for example, like basically say, let's let's have people do you know do what they've been doing, give them superpowers in terms of being able to tell if there's like a you know a hazard ahead that another another vehicle has seen, or if they're getting drowsy, or, or these types of things. Um, but with with the assumption being that the, the driver's still in charge of driving the car. And then using that information, you know, we can start to you know, teach, teach autonomous vehicles what, what that police officer, when they do this, what that means. Mm -hmm. um, the only way to, to handle that is not to like, build a level five car and then put it out there and then have it be like, I don't really know what to do, driver. Why don't you tell me what to do? Um, I think uh, kind of this, this more uh, modular. Well, are, are we close to that? Are we close to being <laughs> able to recognize what this means? I don't think anybody's working on that problem yet. I think that, that that's something that's like so far down the road of like being able to do kind of this like, like we're, you know, we're still kind of in the world of like Mobileye being able to figure out like what, where a lane is. Like that's kind of like the easiest thing to, I mean, Mobileye is like a really cool company and like they're doing awesome things, but like it's like identifying the lanes. And I mean, I'm sure as, as some of you have probably driven on roads where it's like, it's, ne it's not really clear whether you know, kind of two cars are driving next to each other and then it slowly just turns into one lane. Like that's, that's a hard problem even for us to do. We, we rely on visual cues from other vehicles and things like that, but it's, it's like a hard problem. Um, and it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's harder to make a machine. Well, there, there are a lot of hard problems. There's regulatory problems, there's legal problems, there's problems of snow on the road where you can't read the lane markers. All these things get into the question of the timetable and the question of this handoff. Um, how long is it gonna be before we get to say, level four, any of you could take that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think probably a lot, a lot of people ask, ask the question of like when, when will all, or when will we have the ability to have all cars be autonomous? And I think that's probably, um, well, A, like an impossible question to answer, like for sure, like the, there was a survey of like people who, you know, like the Bosches and the, you know, the automakers of the world, and basically like where kind of from a timeline perspective, and I think the answers ranged, this was maybe more than a year ago, but the answers ranged from like late 2019 was like the most aggressive and then like 2028, I think, was the most conservative. Um, but I think, I think that the, maybe the interesting points as, from, from A to Z, the interesting points along the way are gonna be, when do we have the ADAS system that can like avoid you know, rear-ending rear cars, which may be like 90%, I, I don't know what the figure is, but that, that may be like most accidents are, are that type of accident where someone's looking at their Instagram feed and, and, they're not, and they, you know, they, they rear on the car mm -hmm. in front of them. Can we put that functionality into a car? That's like a pretty like, segmented uh, piece, and then maybe we can add that to the self-driving ability. And then maybe later on we can add another one and another one and another one towards, um, towards these things. Yeah, I, th I think the other way you can accelerate adoption and things that will happen kind of in the, the interim before every car has level five autonomy uh, is using, using geofencing and using con constrained environments to avoid some of the edge cases, avoid the construction situation, avoid the, uh, you know, the unknown intersection. And so you see companies like May Mobility testing fully autonomous shuttles in downtown Detroit. They're using a combination of some infrastructure, but it's mainly, uh, a lot of it is uh, restricting the routes that a vehicle can go on. So they, they have high definition, well updated maps. Uh, they know what the lanes are. They know uh, they can locate themselves precisely. Uh, and so by avoiding some of those edge cases, you can experience full autonomy uh, in constrained environments earlier. Well, I, I, I would oh, just go ahead, that, Karen. I would just add that often when people ask that question, when is it going to happen, it's either A, because you're super excited and you want it here tomorrow, or B, you're freaked out and you want it, somebody to say it's not going to be until 2050, so you don't have to worry about it. And uh, I think that it's, it's going to be much more of a gradual integration of these sort of uh, isolated places mixed in with where we can find it safe. The car is going to be able to tell you which stretch of highway 
is safe for this and which isn't. And uh, interestingly, as someone, uh, my background, I lived in Detroit and worked in Detroit for nine years, and I ran the Oldsmobile division at General Motors. And I can tell you that uh, when the car was invented, uh, cars and horses coexisted on the roads for 30 years in the early 1900s. And so if you keep that concept in your mind, there's going to be a transition over time. It's not going to just be here today, here tomorrow. We're going to learn how to integrate this new technology both in the vehicles that we drive today with greater safety, security, and interesting capabilities technology, and, and it will gradually become part of something that we can accept and, and wrap our brains around in terms of the true technological advancement. When we look at these geo-fenced areas that are going to be leading the way to autonomy, where are they? I mean, Silicon Valley is kind of a given, I guess. But where, where are some of the other areas that are leading in autonomy? Maybe places that people aren't thinking of, really. I, I think Please. one, yeah, I think so one, one, one example that a lot of people, a lot of smart people are working on already are like any closed community. So retirement yeah. communities, um, you know, uh, any, any area like that, uh, fixed route, kind of these, these taxi cab, taxis or, or automated shuttles that basically just continuously do loops. Um, you know, a lot of people are working on that. I, again, I mean, the, the whole paradigm of um, automation, if you think about what, what the word automation meant 40 years ago, it was basically like these big industrial robots in factories, you gotta put them in cages, keep them away from people, highly structured and constrained environments. Trying to make the, the messy transportation outside world look as much as we can like that makes the problem a lot easier. Nothing is more unstructured than me checking my, I don't do this, but like, well, everybody, I think everybody says that they don't do this, but like, is like, is like me checking my Instagram feed and then like drifting because it's like, you can't really model like that. It's like, if I'm looking at a really cool post, maybe I'm doing something weird or like, if I'm looking at it, it's like, how do you model that as an autonomous vehicle? It like looks at it and it's like, okay, is this guy drunk? Like what, what's going on? Like that's the most unstructured environment and anything to do to limit that. So sorry, but to answer your question, I think like close you know, closed courses, special lanes and highways, I think we're already start starting to see things like this. I'm yep. going to be doing two other panels that are about connected cars. One is about the sort of living room on wheels concept of what the interior of the car is going to be. And the other one is on connected trucks. And I tend to think that we're going to see autonomy in trucks before we see it in cars in terms of uh, platooning. But we'll be talking about that later. Um, one thing I did want to mention to the panel here is the concept of electric vehicles and autonomy. Do those go closely together? It does seem to me that for a lot of reasons, self-driving cars will also be electric. They'll be connected, electric, and autonomous, those three things. Is that right, or do you have a different vision of that, any of you? Yeah, I would, I would absolutely agree. Um, part of the reason is uh, I have a feeling that autonomy will make its way out into the world first through fleets. Uh, people won't own an autonomous car uh, initially. They may first experience it through a, a mobility service provider. And those companies care a lot about marginal cost. They're, they're laser focused on how much does it cost to get a rider from point A to point B. And the cheapest way to do that is through an electric vehicle. Uh, electric vehicles also have much lower maintenance costs, much lower uh, downtime because of maintenance. So uh, if you care about keeping an autonomous car on the road uh, as much as possible, uh, there's, there's no other option but electric. Uh, Karen and Adam, you each have 30 seconds. We only have a minute left. <laughs> uh, just quickly, is the future autonomous, electric, and uh, connected? Um, okay. Uh, well, I think that uh, what we're dealing with today is a convergence of a very old industry that all of us have a lot of passion around. I mean, one of the things that I loved when I was literally in the automotive industry was how passionate everybody was about this topic. It's something that all of us can relate to. Combined with what we now come to know of as the Internet of Things, right? How our lives are connected in a way that we couldn't have foreseen years ago. And I think if you really think about how exciting it is to think about our vehicles being connected to the rest of our lives in a way that is totally advantageous to the way we uh, go about our daily business and optimizing our time, our safety, our security. I have um, to cut you off, awesome. Karen. I'm done. Uh, Adam, you got 30 <laughs> seconds. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'll, I'll just leave it with uh, the fact I'm super excited. I think, like, we're. 
in the past like five to ten years, we've seen like the tool set grow, uh, and people are only just starting to scratch the surface of what we're able to do in terms of applications. And um, yeah, I'm just excited to, to talk to the people who are building the you know sort of the, the next thing that's going to happen. We're at a definite crossroads in uh, human mobility. As, as Karen pointed out, it took a long time to go from the horse to the horseless carriage. Now we're going to go from the car to the connected, autonomous, and electric car. They'll be coexisting on the road for a while, and uh, it's a real cool time to be studying this space. So I want to thank again my um, three panelists, Karen Francis, who's a board member of NATO, Zach Barras, who's a partner at the MWI Ventures, and Adam Kell with Comet Labs, is an investment partner there that does uh, artificial intelligence work. Thanks a lot. There's a lot more uh, exciting stuff coming on on this stage. Don't go too far away. I'll be back tomorrow and on uh, Friday, too. Thank you. Thanks, Jim.